Okay, good morning. We are glad that you're here this morning. Um, if it gets warm, please feel free to get up and turn the air on. Um, it's kind of that temperature where we really don't need it, but sometimes it gets warm in here. Um, <clears throat> I was just telling the folks up front that I hope we have this kind of weather on May 25th at the picnic. I'm, I'm sorry that everybody, everybody can't be at the picnic at the same time, but um, it is a nice time to get together, and we sure, we're sure looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to Orlando today at 4 o'clock for a meeting for the Florida Regional Grace Conference. So the January 2014 conference, we're going to start planning that today. So uh, pray for the men and the people that are going to be there today for that. Uh, I did want to remind you about Joel Eicher. Now, Joel's at Disney today with uh, my son and Wesley and uh, Natalie. They're all over there at Disney having some fun. They're playing hooky from church which they feel very comfortable doing. My boys, especially because they hear me all the time. They don't need to come here to hear me. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, Joel got his orders this week. And so he's, uh, June 18th, he's headed to San Antonio for basic training. And then he goes to Biloxi for 35 days of uh, tech school. And he's going to be a loadmaster which means he's going to get on a transport plane with uh, whatever they're going to transport. He'll stay with that plane until its destination, and he'll unload it, and then he'll wait for the next load, and they go to the next place. So he's going to be flying all over the place, uh, United States and probably the rest of the planet. So he's going to be spending a lot of time on a KC-130 and probably some other transport vehicles and uh, aircraft, and he's going to have a lot of fun doing that. I think at 19, that's going to be a nice way to see the world for a little bit. Um, so that's encouraging that he, he'd been waiting and waiting and waiting and he finally got his order. So that's good. And, uh, let's see, we have, uh, uh, we have a ladies Bible study on May 4th. So don't forget that, put that on your schedule and don't forget the picnic on the 25th, if you can make that. And, uh, if you were here at nine o'clock for fellowship this morning, you would have been standing in the parking lot. Because uh, Dave called me and he had a little emergency and he had the donuts. He was standing at the place getting the donuts and he said, can you come down and pick these up? And uh, I said, sure. I was at the restaurant with Jose. We were having breakfast and uh, it took a little longer than normal because there was about 45, 50 people from the United States Army in there having breakfast. And so then I ran down to get the donuts and I got there and there was a line and then I got here and Frank was standing here and Frank forgot his key to get in. So... They're all having fellowship in the parking lot this morning. So we're glad you're here, and uh, things don't always go exactly smooth every week here, but um, we're glad you're here today. Uh, had a nice meeting with Scott's parents on uh, Thursday, uh, his dad and uh, a friend of his, and um, that was nice. That was a good meeting, and uh, there's been a lot of interesting things happening this week. So... Uh, I got another poem I wanted to read to you. This is in line with some of these poems we've been reading. Uh, today we're going to talk about assurance, full assurance. And uh, we're going to talk about that. I told you last week to read Romans 9, and, uh, or Romans 9, Romans 5, because we're going to be in Romans 5. We're probably not going to get into Romans 5 this week, but we're, gonna, we're setting you up for that, so we're going to work on that today. But uh, I wanted to read this poem. This is very interesting. Mr. O'Hare says, I'll not depend on guessing. This is kind of a, 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 I thought this was good for assurance. He says, I'll not depend on guessing. I surely want to know if there really is a heaven and how I there can go. In God's book, he tells lost sinners how to reach that holy place through faith in Christ the Savior by his abounding grace. I thought that was a pretty good poem. Uh, he says, how long on earth will you abide, remain in your present sphere? What has happened to all who have died? Where did they go from here? We all go from here to another place, either saved or lost. Are you still rejecting God's saving grace? You better count the cost. So uh, we had a situation this week with the bombing in, in Boston that uh, some people made some bad decisions and uh, found themselves hurled out into eternity and uh, found out that Allah was not God and found out that, uh, that Jesus Christ was, and now I think that happens instantly when you die, 
for lost and saved people. And uh, this young man, who had, they, they finally got him, uh, the little brother, uh, found him in a boat bleeding to death, and uh, he, he wasn't in much shape to fight back, I don't guess. So he's going to get a chance. Now, whether they're going to execute him or not, I do not know. That's up to the government. But I do know this. Between now and then, he's going to have a chance to get saved. Okay, Something that his other brother did not seem to get. So it, it pays to be ready, doesn't it? Uh, that little boy who ran across the, he was running to meet his dad as he crossed the finish line, got killed. Those two other little girls got killed. And uh, our heart goes out to those folks. It, you know, you just, you don't realize that when Paul says evil men shall wax worse and worse, you say, how could it get worse and worse? But it is. It's getting worse and worse. And, uh, you know, as we say, stress is accumulative in your life. It, it's, it piles up on you. Uh, sin is also accumulative. So when you get 7 billion people on the planet, you're going to have more sin than you have if you've got a billion people on the planet, right? Plus, you're closer together. And uh, the doctrines of devils are working. That mystery of iniquity that Paul talks about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says that is already working. So, so God has a plan that's mysterious in nature, the, the plan we call the revelation of the mystery, but Satan also has now countered that plan with the mystery of iniquity. His plan of iniquity is already going. It, it's been going. And it has some restrictions on it. There are some things he can and cannot do, but I'm going to tell you that one of the things he is definitely doing is he, is he is subverting the world religiously, and it's real obvious when you start looking around you. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that, that there are that just every year, every year it seems like it's getting worse and worse, and, and not only in the crime and all the other things, but uh, it's even our government and, and the people that are in leadership in this country, not only the religious leaders but the government, they're having trouble with basic moral issues. What marriage is, <laughs> you know, what murder is, because they, they say we don't want to kill anybody by execution or whatever, but then they kill 4,100, 4,200 children a day in this country in the womb. And all those little children are children that, yes, we know that if they were born and grew up, they wouldn't all be saved. So they have opportunity now that they didn't have before. If they'd have been born, they might not have been able to make it where they are now. There's 100,000 of them worldwide every 24 hours this is happening to. Now that's not from wars or pestilence or, or, or famine or anything. That's from people paying to have this service done. 100,000 a day. And that's a conservative estimate. And I believe that figure, it's pretty close because uh, there is a lot of information like that is flowing to central locations. And uh, the Catholics have really been keeping track of that. And I tell you what, that's one of the ministries they have that I, I can appreciate. You know, 100,000 kids a day times 10 days is a million. So when you think about a million, okay, three, 300,000 in just three days, or, or, or you go 30 days, and you look at that, and you go 300,000, you, you look at these numbers, and you start looking at that, it's like, Wow, that's a lot. Genocidal maniacs doing this, all in the name of what? Medicine. Yeah. Strange, isn't it? Kind of out of, kind of out of whack, isn't it? Well, that's just one aspect of it. There's a whole lot of other things going on that we look at and say, "Well, that's terrible too." In the midst of all of it. We're going to look at something that you and I really need to focus on uh, pretty much every day. I can tell you that I do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I know that I have to. And uh, that is the full assurance of understanding. So today's message is going to be about the full assurance of understanding. Turn with me, if you will. Let's go over to, uh, let's start in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8 is a good place to start pretty much any time. You've heard of, of, of life insurance. Well, we've got, we've got life assurance, and we don't have to pay for it. Eternal life assurance. And uh, I want to tell you today that the roots of what we believe and the roots of what we understand go all the way back to before the foundation of the world. Not, not just from the foundation of the world, but before. So we're going to show you how that works and the difference between that, and we're going to look at the two immutable things today from the book of Hebrews, the covenant and the oath, and we're going to show that you're, you're going to understand 
from the foundation of the world and from before the foundation of the world and how that fits into God's plan of security for you. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the shed blood at Calvary. Thank you for the gospel of the grace of God and the grace that brings salvation to all men. We thank you for uh, the free gift of God and we thank you for the righteousness that's imputed to us by faith in Christ. We thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, the full assurance of understanding is, is an important doctrine. I've told you before, um, in the layout of the book of Romans, uh, in the actual foundational issue of Romans, you've got 1 to 5, uh, 6 through 8, 9 to 11, and 12 to 16. And I, I've shown this diagram to you many times. It was taught to me, and I, I'm teaching it to you. Romans 1 to 5 is the gospel. Uh, 6, 7, and 8 is sanctification. Uh, 9, 10, and 11 uh, is about Israel and what's going on with their past, their present, and their future. 9, 10, 11. And then 12 through 16 is life in Christ in the local church. The, the grace life lived out and how to live among the lost, how to live among the saved uh, in the church, how to live with your government, Romans 13, how to live with those that are opposing you. Uh, you get that some of that in Romans 16. And, and so there's a lot of great information in the book of Romans. It's, it's foundational. That's why it is where it is. But Romans chapter 5, it's interesting that it's the end of that first section because it deals with the security. Romans chapter 5 is the security chapter. And uh, I'm going to tell you that we need to understand why this is in chapter 5. The reason it's in chapter 5 and it's placed there is it's the final aspect of the gospel that you have to understand so that you don't get discouraged and worried about losing eternal life. You cannot lose eternal life. It's not possible. So when you, when you get to this point, you, you're, you're hearing Romans 1. He talks about... God giving up the Gentiles. Chapter 2, he gives up the religious Jew. Chapter 3, he's condemned the entire world. Chapter 3, the last half, you get the gospel of grace. Chapter 3, 21 to 31. And then in chapter 4, he's going to go into an entire chapter about how this has always been by grace through faith without works. He's going to demonstrate those two great examples of Abraham and David are going to be demonstrated uh, to show that a man living before the law and a man living under the law were both justified by faith and that it's always been this way. His case among the heathen is not that this is some new way to get to God. This is the same way everybody's always had to get to God, but there were some differences back here under the law in that they had a religious system where they, whereby they had to function and they had to function under it and they lived during a time back there where they were all their lifetime, they were subject to the fear of death, and it was through that bondage of being under the law that they were constantly being, being afraid of dying. Now, it wasn't so much about dying and going to hell. It was just dying, period. Okay? So under the law, what was the issue? Living and dying. That was the issue. Now... Hell was an issue back there, don't get me wrong. It, it, it was a major issue, but the real issue under the law was to stay alive, was to not do something that God would punish you for that would result in death. Let me give you an example. Go over to Ephesians chapter. The law principle is very clear. Ephesians chapter 6 the first commandment of the Ten Commandments that has a promise attached to it. And Paul says this because it's important that children obey their parents. Uh, Jason mentioned this concept this morning about what happens to children when they don't obey their parents and how, and how hard that is. Look at children. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother. He's going to quote, the, there he's quoting the Decalogue right there. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And here's the promise, verse, 30, verse 3. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, if you kept, if you kept, the, pro, if you kept the law there, and you honored your mother and father, does that give you automatically a guarantee of living till you're 100 years old or whatever? It does not. 
What it's teaching you is that if you're smart and you do listen to what God says and you obey the word of God and you listen to what he says and obey your parents and honor your parents and learn from them and have a good relationship with them instead of them being the enemy, then what can happen is you can learn from them the things that you're going to need to get through life and you'll live. That it may be well with thee. It doesn't get, it's not a guarantee of long life, but you have to understand the Jew has a mindset. The, the Jew's mindset was that the kingdom was life. That was eternal life. So when they were looking forward to a kingdom, they were looking for something that they would walk into, and as Christ says, enter into life. That's why there's only one gate to get in, and if you try to get in another way, you're a thief and a robber. You can't get in another way. So you don't preach it that way. You preach that you enter freely into it, and you go into it, and that, that kingdom program is something that they look for in which they will transition from being a normal living person into a person who has eternal life. Their goal in Judaism is not to go to heaven. It's for heaven to come to earth. That's why it's called the kingdom of heaven. When Abraham looks for the city whose founder and maker is God, he's looking for that kingdom. That's what he's looking for. He's looking for it because he believes in it. So this full assurance of understanding is really centered around the idea that Paul needs to stabilize the new believer. So once you get saved in chapter 3 of Romans, you get to understand the, the works issue is now settled. There is no works. There are no works for you. As a matter of fact, it has to do with you ceasing all possible attempts at working. That's what it's all about. And it's not about you trying to do something to gain God's favor. It's for you to do something that, that really doesn't require any work at all. And that's just simple faith, believing what God says. And this is why Paul quotes Genesis 15, verse 6. And he says that Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, this is really an important passage in chapter 4. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. But I want to say that, that, that God, before you learn about assurance of eternal life, God also gives assurance to all men about eternal death. Look over at uh, Acts chapter 17, and we won't belabor this point because we've been studying up to this point, and we've already looked at this. Last week we were talking about in Adam all die, and then we went, or be week before, and then we went through, last week we went through the, the idea that there's no hope in the grave. There isn't. There is no hope in the grave whatsoever. We're not looking to go to the grave. We're looking to go to the Lord and meet the Lord. So look at what he says in Acts 17. I'll just, we'll just read this passage quickly. And in verse 30, Paul says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but commandeth all men everywhere, what? But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now that's one of the famous 13 but nows of the Apostle Paul. Go through and study all 13 of them, and you'll find out that they're worthy of all acceptation, and, 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 and they're something that you should be studying, and they're worthy of the acceptation of all. So if you look at these 13 but nows, you're going to see that every time you see that phrase, you're, you're seeing that this is the way it's been, okay? But now it's like this right here. Now we got something different. Paul says, I've got it. Now you're going to get it. And he's going to, and he's going to be the one to give it to you. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. He magnifies his office. He gives us the message from the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this thing here demonstrates when he says that he hath commanded all men everywhere to repent, he expects men to change their mind now about their sin issue and start listening to the new message of the cross. Verse 31, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given, notice, assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. So it's not a dead man you're dealing with. It's an alive person. It's a person who's alive from the dead. Last week in Revelation 1.18, we saw that Jesus Christ, uh, as you see him there talking to John, he's got the, you see the pictorial view of him as you see in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9 back there. You see him standing there with the keys of death and hell on his belt. He's overcome it all. He is now raised from the dead. 
He says, I was dead and I'm alive. So he's alive forevermore. He sits at the right hand of God. And now he is there for us and demonstrating to us who we are, teaching us who we are. Now, this is tr quite strange to a lot of people. They don't quite seem to understand how this all fits into the program of God with Israel and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts and so forth. I've told you before, there are three transition books in your Bible, Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews. And uh, if you want to understand how this segue takes place, you need to read Matthew, understand how it goes from Old Testament Judaism to New Testament Kingdom Saint Christianity, and it eventually becomes Christianity with them. But really, it's really focused here when we start talking about Christianity. See, the, the Jews were, the believing Jews were called Christians, but they were first called Christians where? At Antioch. Well, if they were first called Christians at Antioch, then you find out that, that there's something going on because that's where Paul had gone down and that's where he starts studying. The, the, the church at Antioch is really where it, where it starts. I joke a little bit about that and say that Paul started the church in Antioch with the persecution that arose about Stephen. He's the one that chased all the kingdom saints down there to begin with. But there's some interesting things going on down there. It's fascinating when you see it because, for instance, the Jerusalem saints, they're called the poor saints at Jerusalem, you find out. You learn later that they're poor. And after they gave all their money up and divested themselves on the day of Pentecost, they're, they're starting this new life, and here they have all things in common, and this whole year of extension begins to go, and then the whole thing changes on them. And Saul gets saved... And the kingdom program takes a twist. Uh, I, I was, we were studying today with Jason in the, over there in Acts 26. And boy, what a biopic on, on Saul. If you go to Acts 26 and you read about how much he did, okay, go over to Acts 26 and just look at this. This is, fan, this is fantastic. Uh, he was talking about that this morning, comparing his, he talking about his conversion which you read about three different places there in the book of Acts. Well, Acts chapter 26, just in a few verses, let me read, I just jotted these down while we were listening to him talk, and, and I th notice what he says. I'm going to read these, I'm going to read these phrases, and look at the passage there in 26, and look at verse, uh, uh, look at verse 8. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 9. Look at verse 9, 10, 11, go on down. Now look at how many things are stated. I'm just going to read these to you. Now I'm just going to read the statements so you get the idea. Many things contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. That's one of the first things he says. Received authority. He didn't reject the authority to go do it. He received it. He went and asked for it. He says, I shut up in prison. I gave my voice against them. I punished them oft. Compelled them to blaspheme. Exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them. I went to Damascus. He chased them. Now, when you just write those little phrases down in just those few verses there, you get the idea that there is a change going on in the kingdom church, and the kingdom church is not really going the way it's supposed to go. I mean, it's going up here, and all of a sudden, the, the, one of the seven that they had chosen to take care of the duty of the apostles because they didn't want to be taking care of the warehouse and handing out all the goods every day, so they chose these seven men. Stephen was one of them. All of a sudden, they martyr Stephen. But it's not just an untimely martyr. It's not just a murder. It's, it's way more than that. It's that there is a new man on the scene who is now not going to take any more of this. He's going to stomp it out. He's going to just get rid of it. Okay? He's going to get rid of this little cult. And he is taking it upon himself as part of the leadership of Judaism to go out there and do this thing for God and get rid of this pack of wolves and get them out of Jerusalem. And he chases all of them out of Jerusalem. Well, as you see all that unfold, you realize now that he goes from being the scorned and the enemy of Jesus Christ. I mean, when Jesus meets him, he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? How would you like to have Jesus Christ say that to you the first time you ever met him? He goes from not knowing him to knowing him real quick. And when he says, what will thou have me to do, Lord? 
somebody tried to tell me that he was going to do something good right there to get saved, I said, oh, come on. I mean, he's calling him Lord already, okay? <laughs> he's, not, he's bowing down. He's got his ears down and his head between his legs. He, his, eye, or his tail between his legs. He's, he's down. He's hunkered down. He's on the ground. We saw this morning that he didn't eat. He didn't drink for three days, and he doesn't have any eyesight. Why would you? What's so important in your life that you wouldn't eat or drink for three days? If you're in a trance having a discussion with the creator of heaven and earth that you've been persecuting and killed probably upwards of 20,000 of his converts, wouldn't you not worry about those things? <laughs> you're lucky if you could live through it. Saul was a mean guy. He was the perfect candidate for the Antichrist at that time. Not only was he the rebellious person that he was, but he was leading the rebellion. He was leading the charge. In the Indians, when the Indians come, uh, uh, you know, see this in the movies, the guy with the big headdress. You see the guys with the two little feathers and the braves, you know? But then they got the guy with all the eagle feathers hanging down here. W what is he? He's the chief, isn't he? Now, he's not saying he's the worst. No, the chief is, he's the guy who's done the most. He's not, he's not the worst guy in the group. He's the best guy in the group. He's out there in the front leading them. But, but what he's saying is, when he says he's the chief of sinners, he's leading the rebellion against the Lord Jesus Christ, which Christ stops, by the way, in its tracks. Now, he's given assurance unto all men that... They're accountable to God, and they have a responsibility to God. Romans chapter 1 makes that clear also. Now, Israel also, turn over to uh, Acts chapter 2. Israel has a responsibility, and Peter brings forth the indictment that, that brings out this responsibility and, and really indicts them for the murder of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 22. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Luke begins this book by talking about the many infallible proofs of the Lord Jesus Christ. There were no, this was not hocus pocus going on. This was not magician, uh, a magician trying to do these things. This was not like Janus and Jamboree's down in Egypt. This is the real thing. These are the credentials of God on earth. He's here. And he says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The indictment stands. Uh, they had a guy on uh, one of the TV shows one time, and he was really upset about talk, Everybody's talking about the, you can't say the Jews crucified Christ. You can't, you can't say that. And the guy that was talking to him pulled that verse out and read it right there. He says, yeah, but we don't believe that. We don't believe the New Testament is part of God's word. This rabbi didn't. So? <laughs> I mean, just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not true, right? That's what Paul says in Romans 3. What if some do not believe? He says, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Don't worry about it. God's going to be vindicated in his day. They'll all hear it as his word eventually, and they'll all believe it's his word. Look over at uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, where we are all witnesses, verse 32, Acts 2, 32, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having uh, received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, the Holy Ghost, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith uh, himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Up, up till now, the phrase has always been until I make thine enemies thy footstool. But now it's called the word foes is used. Why is that? Because they've gone from being a passive enemy to an active enemy. During the ministry of Christ, they begin to go from being actively against, uh, passively against him by speaking against him over here. They did try to take him several times, which they could not do. But over here, they crucify him. They get him and they crucify him. And now it's clear, it's clear by inspiration that Israel is now no longer just a passive enemy. I'm talking about the leadership of Israel. That they are now foes. 
So the enemy is not static. It's not somebody who's just there. They're across the border. You know, you can see the enemy. But when they come across the border at you and they're ready to get you, then they're chasing you, then, then, then they're foes. They're, that's an active enemy. And he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know what? Assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Wow. Now, he indicts the nation. And so you understand now that God has given assurance to all men that there is a God and that Jesus Christ is that God who is going to judge the, the quick and the dead. You now know also that Israel is guilty for the crucifixion. They have been charged and indicted with it. And now look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So he gives assurance to both groups. But now he gives us some assurance that's quite a bit different. To us, he does not talk this way. To us, he talks to in a different way. To us, he talks as though we're members of his family. He talks to us as though we're part of of his own inner sanctum, his own family, his own sons. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, and look at verse 3. Uh, we'll start in verse 2, sorry. 1 Thessalonians 2, and look at verse 2, or 1 verse 2, excuse me. He says, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing, notice he says, your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. He says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but, in, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in what? Much assurance. Part of that gospel message is, not, I mean, part of it is you getting saved, but, but a big part of it, an entire chapter I mean, he devotes chapter 5, the entire chapter, to this issue. He only gives you 10 verses of the gospel in Romans 3, from 21 to 31. But when you get to chapter 5, he's going to give you an entire chapter. Why is that? Because after you get saved, you're going to get attacked. And you need stability. You need armor. You need protection. You need those things. Now, he's not going to put a hedge of protection around you like Satan said you know, he had done around Job. He's not going to do that. You, you can go out and get killed just like anybody else. Those people on, on the Boston Marathon last week, they, they, they came face to face with what was going to be a fun day and then turned out being a day of horror for many, many people. Well, it only takes one or two guys or a few that have been so radically inducted and so radically perverted and, and twisted in their minds about these doctrines of devils and this idea that, that, that they're going to fix this whole thing by killing people. How cold is it that a young man walk up with a backpack, sit the backpack down in the doorway, look at the man in the eyes, and walk right around the building and watch it blow up? And they try to wake the guy up in the hospital, and he asks for a paper and says, hey, I saw his face, and he identified that boy. The bomb didn't do its job completely, did it? The guy lost his legs, but he didn't lose his life. You know, death is just that close. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't live in a world where we're protected by God. Look over at Romans chapter 8. Now, Israel did have under the law some protection like that when they were behaving okay read the sin of Achan and you'll see that they, they didn't get it all the time Romans chapter 8 well when God when Israel messed up it was bad because when, when one part of that country when one part of that nation messed up God would actually take the punishment and put it on the whole nation he treated them as a unit as a family you hear that man's uncle saying, he's brought reproach upon our family. He's done all this stuff. He was really mad at his nephews. And, and it was like, he, he also went so far as to say that he's brought reproach and, and shame upon the entire Chechnya 
ethnicity. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry to say those boys did it, but that's been going on for a while over there. You know, a lot of Al-Qaeda in Chechnya. They've been training there for a long time. And uh, the, the Russians have fought them twice already. The Russian government has. And they, they can't deal with them either. Somebody's going to deal with them. And uh, I know that whoever deals with them, they're going to try to do the best they can. But I do know this, and I take comfort in this, and I rest in this. God's going to deal with them right there. So we'll just let God take care of that. In the meantime, what should we do? Our job isn't to shoot them. Our job is to give them the gospel, try to get them saved. It's hard to do with some folks. You see why Satan wants to trick people into believing these things so that you can't reach them with the gospel of grace? Because they, they won't listen, see? They're subverted, and that's what happens. Look at Romans chapter 8, and you'll see here how that God considers us as his own family. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, we now have a father that we can call father other than our human father. Everybody's got a human father. Don't always get to know him. Don't always get to have the best relationship with him. We thank God for those that do. But I always tell folks when you get saved, hey, if you got trouble with your father or your mother... You need to forgive them for whatever they did, okay? Start right there. Cut that line off right now. Forgive them for that. But now start to get to know your new Heavenly Father so that you can move on, as Paul says, leaving those things which are behind. So we have no way to carry that baggage into our life. It's not possible that we should do it. Colossians chapter 2 and 3 will teach you about how important it is for you to foster these relationships in life, and you can't hold grudges, even against terrorists. Now, you don't have to hang out with them. I don't recommend it. <laughs> okay. But, but I will say this. If I had opportunity to give the guy the gospel in the jail, I would. Wouldn't you? What else would you say to him when you met him? What else could you say to him? You know who Murph the Surf is? You ever heard of him? Read that book back there by Oscar Woodall, uh, Search for Security. And you'll find out who Murph the Surf was, a criminal guy. And uh, when Oscar was writing that, we were having a discussion about his meetings with uh, the two ladies that were involved with Charles Manson murders. The one man who actually did the murders, and then there were two girls. And uh, he had a chance to talk to those two girls, both of which had gotten saved since they were in prison. But the man, uh, I forget his name, uh, it's... I forget what his name was, but uh, he was the guy that actually did the butchering and killed Sharon Tate and the other people in that house. And uh, he was so racked with guilt, he, would, he could not receive the gospel of grace. He, he just couldn't believe that was all that God was going to ask him to, to do was to believe the gospel. He, that was too much after what he had done. But the two girls did believe it. I think that's fascinating, okay? Uh, you know... Even people who do heinous things, terrible, really bad things, can be brought low and come to that point in their life where they have no assurance of where they're going to go. And yet, I will tell you that there probably is, in every man, some degree, probably greater in some than others, depending on their backgrounds, there is some degree of assurance that they're going to hell, and they understand that pretty well. I believe some people have more of that than others because they have a ten people have a tendency to block it out of their minds. They do it with drugs, alcohol. They do it with all kinds of things. But they're really trying to, in their life of escapism, they're trying to run away from the responsibility they have and the conscience, they just can't get away from it. And some are, are easier to deal with than others because their consciences are bothering them more than others. I don't know. You know, it, whenever you talk to somebody, you commend yourself to every man's conscience in the sight of God. With what? What do you have to do that with? Paul says you have the cross to do that with, and that's what you're supposed to use. You're not supposed to use human logic or human reason. You're not supposed to do any of that. You're supposed to tell them that they're lost, they need a Savior, and Christ is the Savior. 
The power of God to get somebody saved is not in your presentation. It's in the gospel itself. That's why, uh, you know, they say the word of God is like a lion in a cage. You don't have to defend it. Just open the cage and let him out, and he'll defend it himself, okay? So you just give the word out. You just deliver the goods. You just preach the word, and you can learn that you now have a message whereby you can take a guy who's a bomber, a murderer, a slaughtering person, a genocidal maniac, whatever he is or she is, and they can learn that they have God now as their father and that they have eternal life. You know, Saul of Tarsus was such a man. He was really the poster child for bad boy, okay? Look at verse 16 in Romans 8. He says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You go over to Galatians 3 and you'll see that we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But how do we get that everyday assurance? How do we get that Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God? How do we get that? I used to read that verse and I said, The, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When does he do that? When you open your book and study that book. Because you're now reading the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're reading the inspired words given to us from God so that you can now begin to learn. You know, we have something very valuable. What do we have? Look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. The average man, the lost man, the unregenerate man, the unsaved man has no clue what God has in store for him. He cannot know it. He has no assurance of it. He has no hope. Paul says that they are without hope. They are completely void of any hope whatsoever. Outside of Christ there is no hope. Because in Adam all die. He says, he says uh, look at verse 11. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does inside of you. He teaches you these things. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but or except the Spirit of God. Teach him these things. That's what he's saying. So the Holy Spirit is in you to teach you. Verse 12, but we have not received, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, if you go down to verse 14, Paul's going to show you that there's a contrast here. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are, what, spiritually discerned. Okay, so if the discernment comes through spiritual truth and spiritual teaching, you know it doesn't come from a better translation into your modern guttural language. It comes from the Holy Spirit. So somebody says, here, read the modern Bible. It'll, you'll, it'll make more sense to you. Well, yeah, it will. From the flesh standpoint... But when the verses are missing, how will you ever learn that verse if it doesn't exist in that Bible? Scott's working on an omission project right now, and I tell you, it's getting, it's getting kind of dicey, isn't it? We went over that Thursday. We're working on this thing a little bit and looking at this, and I'm telling you, he's going through five translations plus the what? The, the King James and the New King James, you, they're the top seven, but you're doing the contrast in the five, the five top-selling Bibles in the in the world right now and we're just we're just categorizing he's categorizing and listing the omissions in every chapter 
We're not even working on the changes that mess up the verses. We're just working on all the verses that are gone or the partial verses that are missing, the words that are missing. You know, it's hard enough to go to a verse where something's messed up and you have to look at it and say, that's not right. That's, a, that's bad to say it that way. But it's another thing when you go there and it's just not even there. He's got, you look at these modern Bibles. They, they'll go from one verse number to another. How do you go from 20 to 22? No 21. Because the verse isn't there. Do you realize the complication for the, for the numbering system when they start messing that all up? How that just takes that domino effect and starts going across there? And uh, we have to change all these things? Well, they can't do it. They just skip the verse. They just skip the number. That's kind of strange. Well, you don't have to worry about that. Because, see, you've got the Holy Spirit, and you can judge everything according to the Word of God. Look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 2.15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Why? Because when you get the truth of God, there isn't anything that can judge you. You've got it. It's like having all the kings on the board when you're playing checkers, man. If you're the guy with all the kings and nobody else has got any kings, your opponent has no kings, who's going to win that game? It's over. When you come to the point where you understand God's word and you've got the truth of God word rightly divided and you figure this thing out and really it's not you doing it it's God teaching it to you but once you figure this out what happens is they can't they can't come at you with these heresies and start teaching you these these terrible doctrines because you have a defense against that and see that's that gives me great assurance it's not just assurance in the fact that I can go out and play Bible ping pong with somebody and maybe get a chance to beat them at it. I'm not talking about that kind of assurance. I'm talking about the assurance that I get from Romans chapter 4 when he teaches me through all those passages that it's not by works, not by works, not by works. You know what I do? I rest in that. I learn it. I believe it. And you know what I do? I just, I just, I really joy in the idea that I don't have anything to do with it. If I touch it, it's going to get messed up. You know that feeling. Anything you put your hand to, it just messes it up. And if you'll just rest and trust in what Christ has already done, you'll find out quickly that that's a huge relief. That's a huge load off of your shoulders. It's that, you know, and, and when the Lord said it, he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. What does heavy laden mean? That's a beast of burden when you load him down and he's trying to walk. And they put these burdens on you to do. That's the, the Sanhedrin would, uh, these Pharisees and Sadducees would put out these, these the, their doctrinal teaching would give you these burdens to carry, to do. They give you a list of to do. Do this, 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 and this, and you can get eternal life. Sound familiar? This is your to-do list. Your honeydew list. You're going to get to heaven by doing these things. And you do all these things, and, and you'll get in. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ says, you who are laboring under that, come unto me. I'm going to give you some rest. I'm going to give you something that will give you some life. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you something that, that's free. Look at verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? That's a really interesting question. How many of you have ever delved into the mind of the creator of heaven and earth? What's on your mind, we say? Tell me. Well, you don't know what's in somebody's mind unless they tell you. Well, he says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? He says, we do. Notice what he says in the rest of the verse. But we have the mind of Christ. Where is it? It's revealed to Paul in Romans to Philemon. Everything God wants you to know is written down right here. And 99% of Christendom hasn't even read it. They don't know where they're at when they go into Paul's epistles. I've told you before, when they want to marry and bury, they go to Paul's epistles because they got all the good verses to do that with. But that's more, there's more there than that. There is a history. We have assurance and that assurance is power. Now, I want you to go back with me, if you will, 
to, let's take a look quickly. Let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 6. And I'll just kind of run through this kind of quickly because I want to talk to you about these two immutable things. Two immutable things. Immutable means unchangeable. It cannot be altered. It cannot be overridden. It's not possible for it to happen. When it's something is immutable, it's, it's just not going to be changed. And when he talks about these two immutable things, notice the context. Look at verse 13. 613. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. This is why you are not to take the name of God in vain and swear by his name because you'll break your promise. He doesn't want you to do that. But God doesn't break his promises and he can swear by no greater than himself so he swears by himself saying surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured he obtained the promise. Abraham, he says for men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Let's shake on it. Let's settle this thing. Let's, let's swear an oath on it. And it settles it. Well, God's telling you that, that this oath he made right here, it settled it. You know when that happened? Fascinating. That happened in Genesis 22. Go back to Genesis chapter 22, and you'll see what was going on there. Now, God never lets you hear a message of faith only with works anywhere near the context. Genesis chapter 22 and something exciting is going on here Abraham is going to offer his son his only son now God starts dealing with Abraham when he's 75 he has, off, he has uh, Isaac when he's 100 and about 15 to 16 years after that, after God hadn't spoken to him for 15 years, by the way, after this episode with uh, uh, Hagar the Egyptian and having this child with this other woman. This silence from God for 15 years. And then, and then Isaac is born. And then 15 years from there, then there's this offering. And... When you look at this, you, you realize that, that Abraham takes on the picture of God the Father here. And Isaac is the son. And here you see that there's going to be a willingness to do this. Look at verse 5, 22, 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now, he's going to take the lad up on the hill, up on the mountain. And this mountain, by the way, is, if you look in Jerusalem right now, just Google, Google the uh, Dome of the Rock and look at the Muslim mosque that sits on this top of this mountain. And if you go in the Dome of the Rock and you walk inside there, there's a big railing. And the very, very top of that mountain is where Abraham offered Isaac, right there. As a matter of fact, you see the evidence of the original uh, Temple of Solomon, and there's a square hewn out in the rock where the Holy of Holies was, and they set the Ark of the Covenant right there. That square is still there. You can see it in the photograph. Fascinating. The top of that mountain had a temple on it, Herod's temple, when Christ died, and that had a big, huge opening uh, that was covered by, it would be like this thing right here would be the Holy of Holies, and it's standing up high enough where people could see the curtain, and this would be represented by the curtain, which was about that thick. It looked just like this thing we have here, kind of, only it was about that thick. It was woven. And that curtain was completely rent in two when the crucifixion took place. And it exposed the Holy of Holies. And everybody could see it. They could see Mount Moriah from Calvary, from Golgotha. And that was to expose the fact God's not in there. He's out here. And it was on that spot that these two are at, right here. Same place. 
And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Isaac's carrying the wood of his own burnt sacrifice. And he says, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And he says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both went, uh, so they went both of them together. No fighting, no strife, no arguing. No trying to run back down the hill because he figures out what's happening. <laughs> he just passively goes up there to go do what he's going to do. He's, he's going with his father because he trusts his father. And when he gets up there, verse 9, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seest thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. When I, when I first started reading this passage, I said, wow, why didn't God know that was going to happen? Well, he did. But with God, he, he doesn't circumvent the will of man. He allows it to freely take its course. And here he goes and he allows this to be demonstrated for a reason. Why? Because God is looking to have Abraham's spiritual life, this life of assurance that he's had for so long with God, come to its highest point and the highest pinnacle. And that pinnacle is for him to offer his own son and to do exactly by faith what he asked him to do. And you know why Abraham did this? Turn back to Hebrews chapter 11. There's a little clue back here. Abraham believed Abraham believed what God was saying. Abraham had been, God had made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And 40 years later, he swears by himself with an oath to confirm that. And he confirms it with uh, Isaac. He confirms it with Jacob. And he confirms it with those three men who we call the fathers that what God has promised, he is going to bring to pass. Nothing can stop this from happening. It's going to happen. Abraham believes that so much. He believes it so fully and so completely. Turn over to Hebrews 11. And let's look at these two passages together. Go back to Hebrews 6 and let's read the rest of that. And then we'll go to Hebrews 11. This promise of immutability in verse 17 of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things, and those two immutable things that cannot be changed is the covenant that was made and the oath that confirmed it, he says, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. You know... Abraham believed something. Look over at Hebrews chapter 11. There was something that Abraham believed that caused him to go through with this, that caused him to trust God. You know what that was? Notice what he says. He says in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he, uh, 
and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. When he received Isaac, he received him understanding who he was as the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood who Isaac was. He understood the purpose of God in Isaac. He knew that in Isaac shall the seed be called. It wasn't going to be in Ishmael. He had already cast him out. He knows now that it's going to be in Isaac. And in Isaac is where we're going to see the, the, the beginning of the race, of the Jewish race, come about. Goes through Isaac, then to Jacob, then to the 12 sons, and then to the nation, and we see it grow. It is through that process, with that forming of that nation, that who comes along? Who comes out of the tribe of Judah? The Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the seed came. And he came through that family, and that's why that family was formed. But when Abraham went up to do what he did, he did it believing that God was going to raise him from the dead. He did it believing that so much that he was willing to kill the boy because he says, hey, I know he's the one, so what's the problem? How do you do that? I couldn't have done that. You couldn't have done that. But we didn't have the kind of relationship with God that Abraham had either. But I'm going to tell you the thing that came about of this is really interesting. That Abraham, once he did that, he says that Abraham became the friend of God. And that's more than just an acquaintance. Can I tell you that you get more than that the minute you trust Christ? Look back at Titus. we got to stop. You know, this whole process that we've been talking about with forming the nation of Israel. and doing This is all part of a kingdom program. And uh, when was the kingdom promised? Well, it was promised from the foundation of the world. You don't really know all the aspects of the kingdom until it starts to be played out. Mostly when, after King David is, comes into play, you begin to see that promise of that, that royal family and that royal line. That's where the kingdom aspect of it is. But I want to tell you that before the foundation of the world, God had something else planned. And it's through this process, this, this working out of this prophetic process, that we see the details and the mechanics of how all these things had to be in place for that cross to occur and that kingdom to get set up and that family, that nation of Israel to be formulated so they could be saved and go to reach the Gentiles and the king. All that is part of Israel's program. It's all part of the prophetic program. But there's a secret policy and a secret plan in place now that is in place because God kept it a secret. And the reason that he did that, he had to do it because if Satan had figured it out, he would not have participated in this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 teaches you that. Now, from the foundation of the world, turn, turn to Titus 1. Uh, and before the foundation of the world are not the same thing. Look at Titus chapter 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. You see, remember over there in Hebrews 6, we just read that by those two immutable things, it proves that it's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. And there he says he cannot lie. Over there it says it's impossible for him to lie. Over here it says he cannot lie. I like cannot and impossible when it comes to my assurance. I cannot be lost. It's impossible for me to be lost. Okay? If I apply those two words to me, I, I really do believe that with assurance comes the power I need to operate and function the dispensation of grace against the world system we face. You're not going to face a bunch of people that don't know anything at all. You're going to face people that don't know anything at all but have been taught something else that's, that's wicked and, and very, very hard to deal with. Whether it be Catholicism, whether it be Buddhism, Shintoism, Hinduism, or Islam. Or 
all the other various forms of Protestantism that are all trying to preach that you get to heaven by works. There is no difference between all these things. They're all the same. They'll all go to the same place, and they all deserve to go to the same place. What we have today is the message that's been given to us with great responsibility, and Paul himself says, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. I can't. He says the dispensation of the gospel has been committed unto me. Woe unto me if I preach it not. Not the, not, not, God's not going to kill him for not preaching it, but the responsibility is that, that he has to preach that. And so do we. But you can't do it without assurance. You can't do it without knowing for sure where you're going to spend eternity. Because in order to overcome the fear and overcome those, those things that people you know, threaten you with, you have to be able to say, well, okay, if that's what it's going to take, that's what it's going to take. A friend of mine just left again for India. He's over there right now again. When he was in the Philippines, uh, he used to go out to these particular islands that they were really, they were supposed to be at. They were kind of off limits because there were cannibals on these islands. And uh, they had people that they knew that had gotten saved in the ministry there that had come from those islands, and they were wanting to go back and reach their families. And he got in the boat with them and went out there, and they were on these islands with these cannibals. And in the Philippines, they still exist. There's still cannibalism out there. And, and even more than that, there's communist insurgents in the mountains, and there's Islamics out there that are radicalized. There's all these things in the Philippines. And, you know, when he went down there, uh, when he moved there, his youngest son was born there, actually. Uh, he was there, uh, in, he was in Singapore for a long time. And uh, then he went to the Philippines for a while and operated as his home base there. Uh, there was a lot of dangerous activity going on. We don't think about that here in the United States. We come to church, everything's fine. We go back and forth to home, we go to work. Everything's fine, no problem. You don't stick your neck out much, you know. But when you start going to some place like that and you begin to stick your neck out and you begin to teach and preach the word of God rightly divided and, and, and you say, well, <laughs> the, most of them are going to say, yeah, that's great. And, and some of them are going to say, that's not so great. And some of them are going to say, hey, come outside. You know, uh, sometimes things don't go exactly the way we want them to. Uh, sometimes we get ourselves into situations that are our own bad decisions. We shouldn't have probably done that to begin with, you know. Just remember, we're not from the foundation of the world. We're not part of that kingdom program. We're, we've, we've been chosen in the body of Christ as members of the body of Christ because God had ordained it before the foundation of the world. He didn't save us before the foundation of the world, but he did make it possible before the foundation of the world to make the vehicle for us to get into available. Now that we're in, we cannot live our lives wondering every day from day to day whether we're going to be lost tomorrow or the next day or the next day. The power in the gospel is knowing that you're saved and understanding that assurance. When we trust God instead of our flesh, we have great assurance. Once we realize it's not of ourselves, we have nothing to boast in, there's nothing to worry about. God's grace brings God's peace and security. That's why he starts every epistle with grace and peace. Stability and peace that passes all understanding. The full assurance of spiritual understanding eliminates the need for intellectual understanding. You don't need it. You don't need to try to figure things out. Just believe God's word and you'll be, you'll be fine. Now, there's uh, a verse I want to close with. Turn over to uh, Colossians chapter 2. It's time to quit. So we'll do that. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Look at verse 1. He says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Notice what he says. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Are you fully persuaded? I hope so. Do you have much assurance 
I hope so. I hope you understand that what you have in Christ is absolutely, totally permanent. And we want you to think about it the same way Abraham thought about it, that if God were to kill you, uh, or if God were to uh, allow you to be killed today, he wouldn't kill you, but if, if you were allowed to be killed for some reason or another, somebody decided they were going to take your life, what's going to happen? You're going to go straight to be with the Lord? To be out of this body? Be present with the Lord? Absent? Present? You're there. And you will get a resurrection body? It's guaranteed. This is assurance. And it's the kind of assurance that gives you the power to carry on. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and we thank you for the security we have in your Son. We thank you for the fact that being justified by faith, now we can have peace with you and, and understand the things that we're to be doing. That we can take away the fear and we can take away the things in our lives by, by understanding the mission and understanding what we're to be doing and that, that, that our personal safety is important and that of our families, it's important, but it is not the thing that which, that's not the thing that we focus on or worry about all through life. It's, it's more important that we give the message out and uh, we all know that death's going to come to all of us at one time or another anyway, and we can just, we would rather stay here and work and do the work of the ministry, but we're not going to fear death, and we're not going to allow that because we understand what death is to us now. It's just a transition. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.